This is a show that brings to the forefront newsmakers, entertainers, and those making a difference in our lives and in our world. Each week is a new adventure with topics ranging from the most serious and cutting edge to the most lighthearted and entertaining. This is Taking Care of Business with Richard Solomon. Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon, Taking Care of Business. And this show is also co-branded with My Father's Place Radio and a lot of other endeavors. We have an incredible show today. We're going to go back to, amongst other things, July 28th, 1973. Where were you back then? Where were you back then in, in 1973? If you were in New York State at the Watkins Glen Speedway, you may have been with 600,000 of your closest music fans. <laughs> and somebody who is actually there is with us today, and that's Donna Swarthow. So welcome to our show. Glad to have you have me there. So you are a lover of music. Yes, I am. I'm a very <laughs> avid collector of music and concerts. All right. So let's talk about your, your love of music. You, concerts, albums, all, uh, meeting all kinds of uh, rock uh, people. Could you talk about that a little bit? How did you get started in all of this? Well, I was 1967. My first concert was Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons at the Schmone County Fair in Elmira, New York. Okay. And just we're, we're working with a new soundboard, so we've got a lot, a lot of things. All right. So... That was, that was Frankie Valley. Now, what radio station did you listen to back then? Oh, WEHH was back then. And then, so so growing up, okay, so I'm going to ask you a, a, a couple of questions. What was your first 45? My first 45 <laughs> was down in the boondocks, I believe. <laughs> okay. The other joy, yeah. Where, where was, what was your first vinyl record purchase? Actually, that was another Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. Okay, and then what? And 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 then what were like the first few concerts that you watched live on television? Uh, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan show. Yes, it wasn't a concert, but you know, right. Okay, music. well, okay. Um, now, for for those people out there that didn't get a chance to see uh, Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan really brought some of the greatest performers. I, mean, I, I, I know that I've seen videos. I think I'm pretty sure it was the Mamas and Papas. I'm sure there was uh, the Doors. The door. Oh yeah, the Doors. In fact, I think um, there was a little controversy about uh, you know the Doors because you know Jim Morrison was somewhat unpredictable. <laughs> and I think didn't he have Elvis Presley on? Uh, yes, he did. Right. And I think all those hip moves were considered. A little controversial. Above the waist. Yes. yes. Always above the waist. <laughs> All right. So you, you embarked on a journey of music exploration. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about that. So what were some of the, the early shows? And then when, when did you decide or realize that you were like, oh, my God, this is great stuff? Well, I live near, I live near Watkins Glen, which also gives me near Cornell University and Ithaca College. And back in the 70s, they had concerts at Barton Hall, like Elton John. Uh, the list went on and on and on up at Ithaca. They had Sly and the Family Stone down in Elmira College in the 1970s. So I was hooked on concerts from the 1970s until now. Okay, and I, I bet you the ticket prices were, were not that horrible back then. Two dollars to five dollars of tickets. Where I saw Elton John for five dollars. Wow, wow! Did you uh, did you garner a very big T shirt and and memorabilia and merch and swag collection? Yes, I have. I have to this very day over a hundred, way over a hundred T shirts. I'm pathetic. <laughs> Every time I go to a concert, you have to buy a T shirt. <laughs> What was what was the cheapest one and what was the most expensive one? Actually, the cheapest one was Summer Jam. It cost me like five dollars. Wow! Now, now in those in those days, the shirts were not of the highest quality. <laughs> no, they were one hundred percent cotton and they shrunk. They shrunk, and if you wash them too many times, they may they kind of really faded away. <laughs> you know, yes, you know, they did. You know the song "Not Fade Away." Yeah, well, that's that's what the 
that's what the shirts, you know, maybe that's what Eric Clapton meant by bell bottom blues. You know, I don't want to fade away. Um, and then, and then what kinds of memorabilia did you acquire? Was it, was it keychains? Was it, you know, what? I had a, an act for getting the band members to give me their guitar picks and their drumsticks. Okay. So I have quite a collection of drumsticks and guitar picks. Okay. So, so off the top of your head, who do you, who do you recall having in, you know, in your collection? Well, just this year I got. Uh, guitar pick at the state fair from REL Speedwagon. So it's okay. kind of like fresh in my mind. Okay. Now with guitar picks, you can get one, but on drumsticks, sometimes you only get one. <laughs> yes. So do, you, do you ever like, you know, try to find the other one or, 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 or swap or anything like that to get now, the there pair? There was one time with uh, John K. Steppenwolf, I got both of them handed to me. <laughs> wow. That's really, really cool. So there came a time when you were at Summer Jam. Yes. All right. So let's let's talk about So I, I did a little bit of research. Uh, it was at the Watkins Glen Speedway on July 28th, 1973. And it featured yes. three bands. Do you remember those bands? Oh, it was the Almond Brothers, the band, and the Grateful Dead. All right. Who opened? The band opened. Wow. And... I, I, from what I understood, the concert was scheduled to be from like twelve to seven, so that's that's a lot. That's a lot of time for three bands. Well, it went on for two days. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so what was what was memorable to you about the whole? First of all, how'd you get there? Uh, from what I saw on the internet, the traffic was just unbelievable. Just it was. Just I went a, up there on Wednesday. I went up was like my high school in Odessa and Watkins Glen. We sold tickets for it. It was they had us. We got credit for our senior class for selling the tickets. So I got opportunity to go up there on Wednesday. Okay. Before so, the trip. So you beat the traffic. Yeah, I left my car at the mall because I didn't want to have my car up there, and I rode up with some friends and never saw them after I got there. I got completely separated from them. Oh wow! And then. So, so what do you do as far as food and, you know, all the other things that you need the place to sleep? <laughs> well, I went up there with a backpack and a tent and a sleeping bag, and I lost all three of them. I really didn't care. Okay. Did you bring food with you? Yes, just like, you know, candy bars and chips and things like <laughs> that, but that was gone in the first day. But it didn't matter. No. Nope. It was now, the the weather upstate can be really hot. Now, I know you, it's upstate and the weather is a little bit more gentle and, you know, near the mountains, it's a little cooler. So, what, but, but the thing is, this was just an open area in the blazing sun. So, yeah. what, what was it like? Was it mosquito-y? Was it hot? Was it swampy? It was hot. And then, of course, it started raining one day. So, but it was, I was amongst, I mean, I, I didn't know at the time, but I was amongst 600,000 people. Did it feel like 600,000 people? Oh, you could, as far as you could see, it was just wall-to-wall people having a good time. So how did people get around? I mean, you know, you know I mean, just getting on the subway is a pain in the, you know, the pain in the rear. How, how, do, you, how do you navigate to get from point A to point B? Well, um, people, you know, the next town was Elmira, and that's like, you know, 30 miles away. People were riding on cars, bumper to bumper, just to get to the concert. The whole, you know, area was nothing but a parking lot. Route 14, Route 17 was a parking lot. So people would just leave their cars wherever they were at and walk in, ride on cars, bumper to bumper, just right on the back of the cars. So it kind of sounds like it had the same kind of Woodstock traffic pattern, you know? Yes, but okay. it was larger than Woodstock. <laughs> Uh, and it was in my in my neighborhood. So, so did they plan on it being as big as? Oh no! So we what only happened? We sold one hundred fifty thousand tickets. That's all we sold. And then all those people showed up, and of course the great gates just got crushed, and it was a free concert. Wow! As I understand it, the ticket was ten bucks, right? Ten dollars. Yes. Wow! Now I also and that included the parking and the camping. I saw that. That's an incredible value when you think about it. So what, so what was it like being in the, the whole camping thing? Was it communal? Um, 
uh, where people like trading T-shirts and memorabilia, um, <laughs> things like that. That's not what. Remember, this was the 1970s, and was, they were trading other stuff. You might say. <laughs> Things that are legal um, now. <laughs> things that are legal in New York State now, right? right yeah, right. Well, but it was, you know, it was the 1970s, so the trading and the stuff that was going on was, you know, it was the 70s. Is all I can say. <laughs> all right. Now, do you still have your ticket stub from the the show? Unfortunately, I sold it on eBay a few years ago for four hundred and ninety five dollars. That's a good deal for a piece of paper that got you that you paid ten dollars for. <laughs> yes, I know. So, so why did you sell it? You have such a big collection. Just um, it was a time it was difficult in my life, you might say. So right. it was it was needed to be. All right. Um, did you make any friends at the concert? Oh yeah, I a matter of fact, I met a person from Boston, and when I decided to. <laughs> be a teenage whatever and I uh, looked him up in Boston to have him put me up for a couple of weeks and I knocked at his doorstep and I jumped in his arms he goes who are you and I was like don't you remember me it was his twin brother that greeted me at the door oh okay <laughs> so yeah it was yeah no, this is all before the internet, right? This is all before. <laughs> so well, this is 1973, yes, way right before the internet. So how did you find somebody without looking them up? <laughs> you know, in those <laughs> days, it really required true detective work to find someone. No, he gave me his he gave me his phone number and his address and told me if I was ever in town to look him up. Okay. So I did about six months later. Yes. All right, and and, and so th that must have been kind of cool. Yeah, but he, his brother's twin brother said, uh, my brother just got married today. <laughs> oh. So oh. It was a stopper. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> Did you go like, awkward? <laughs> yeah. Actually, his, his brother put me up for the two weeks, so it worked out okay. That's it. So who else did you make friends with? And, and do you still keep in touch with any of these people? The, the most kind of the person I met that helped me out, I was trying to buy – chocolate pint of chocolate milk that back then probably sold for a quarter and they were trying to rip me off and sell it to me for five dollars wow and we were hungry and it was hot and this big huge mountain of a guy walked up to the guy and said give her the chocolate milk his name was buddha and he was from the hell's angels wow and yep the guy gave me the chocolate milk and buddha said if you're ever in la you want to look me up i said oh, yeah sure okay but that was the strangest thing that happened to me at the concert wow so let's talk about the music of the concert uh, all right so so wonderful what so first of all how was the sound because it's hard to imagine the acoustics in a place that has to reach six hundred thousand people who themselves are making their own noises well don't forget it's a it was a racetrack so they had speakers all over the area for the announcing the races going on. It was where they had the Grand Prix, the Can-Am, the Formula Racing back in those days. So we had speakers all over the place. So the sound was great. The sound was great. Because th those were sort of like public announcement speakers as opposed to, you know, mu music-oriented speakers. for, for lack of, It wasn't like these were Marshall amps, you know what I'm saying? No, but, but but it was good. The sound that they had, they was they brought in just like truckloads of truckloads of speakers on the stage. I mean, part of the stage looked nothing but speakers. The sound was awesome. Wow. Now, where were you sitting, and and what was your view? <laughs> well, there was times I was in the front row because I was a local person, and I was there early, early, and then I wandered around for just acres and acres and then i find my way back to the front row again now if you were in the front row did you kind of have like you were just at your neck wrenched and you had to like look all the way up because the state that was the stage high it must have been high yeah but we had like i had friends there and they put me up on their shoulders so i sat on their shoulders ah the locals ah see, see locals. that there, there's so basically there's a, a huge huge advantage <laughs> being the yeah, local huge person. Yeah, advantage for being a local person. Yeah, you're there first and you have, you know, and plus some of the people that were security and everything up there were the local people that lived here. So so did you buy a shirt? Did you get a shirt? Yes, I, I did buy a shirt, yes. Do, do you still have it? Oh, that was another eBay uh, thing that I had. So, and I 
Yeah. Did, made a bad mistake. I spelt a word wrong, so I really got taken on that one. So did you yeah, sell the dollars. did you sell the ticket with the shirt as a combo package? No, I sold them separately at the time. Okay. Uh, so what what memories do you have of Summer Jam that people would not think of intuitively? You know, it was it was kind of like you know a big gathering like Woodstock. You had amazing bands that people are well, you know, well familiar with. I mean, the Grateful Dead is well, well familiar, you know, the band and the Allman Brothers. Uh, but, but what happened there that it was like, you wouldn't know that if you weren't there. You know, it was, you know, it was amazing because there was no trouble. There wasn't any people, you know, causing any trouble or it was all just good time. Okay. You know, and to me, it was amazing that all those people were there just having you know, there was, of course, there was people in the, we have waterfalls and walk-ins, Glen, and people were in the waterfalls showering naked, and we had people walking around the town naked, but it was the 70s. Well, what, if they're walking around naked, what would they do for money? <laughs> like, how'd they, <laughs> how'd they carry their loose change? <laughs> uh, well, some of them were naked with, back, with backpacks. Oh, okay. It was kind of cute. So, you know, they would take their clothes off to go into the waterfalls to bathe. Wow, that's real camping, guys. What? So what? Did, the 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 local town I think at the time had about seventeen hundred people. So the, the how did the town prepare for an onslaught of hungry people who needed you know fuel for the cars and <laughs> sandwiches and chips and whatever coffee? They didn't. Everybody, you know, they ran out of everything by the first day, and they had you know they brought in food from the I guess the National Guard or something but yeah it was you know the town was not ready for that kind of people but it was you know you look back at it nothing happened no it was a good time wow now have you looked since that time we only have a minute left in this segment but since that time have you looked back um it, so like you know in the internet to watch some of the performances and has that brought back any memories to you Yes, and matter of fact, somebody sent me a little short clip one time, and I was watching it, and I saw my brother in the clip. I never saw my brother at the concert, but he, I saw him in the clip. Oh, wow. That's really cool. So let's do this. Uh, my name is Richard Solomon. The show is Taking Care of Business. We're looking back at the Watkins Glen, July 28, 1973, Summer Jam with Donna Swarthow. 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 Who, who, you know, Who's there? It is fifty. It's going to be fifty years on the 2023. They ought to do another summer jam in Watkins Glen and repeat it. And you know what? If you go on the internet, if you look, there's a website that's called summerjam50.com, and they're actually talking about that. But we'll be right back. listening to Taking Care of Business, My Father's Place Radio, Richard Solomon, and we were with Donna, who was at Summer Jam and is lobbying for Summer Jam 50. <laughs> okay, so for those who are just tuning in, uh, Donna loves music. She's been to all kinds of concerts, but one that she wants to really bring to uh, our listeners out there is the Summer Jam from 1973 because... It's really not well known. You know, Woodstock has the song by Joni Mitchell, sung by Crosby, Stills, and Nash. It's all, there's a movie, everybody knows about it. There's a big museum up in Bethel Woods. There's a concert arena still there uh, that, that pays homage to Woodstock. But most people don't seem to hear music or references or songs or historical references in everyday radio. Uh, satellite, terrestrial, whatever, about Summer Jam. And yet it was bigger than Woodstock. And uh, I don't know, is it because the music was different? It was only three bands. It didn't have Jimi Hendrix playing the Star Spangled Banner. Is it just didn't have some pizzazz? It was just, was it too jammy? What do you think? No, I know it's just because it was a different time and it was at Watkins Glen, but the music was great. I mean, D Dickie Betts, I've read later, said that the legends go down in history when he, when it comes down to that concert. He he quoted it many times. Wow. So 
Did you meet anybody famous while you were at Summer Jam? Yeah, uh, not famous, but I did meet one of the Hell's Angels, but that's not famous. All right. But but you did meet a lot of famous people later on in your concert goings. Yes. All right, let's shift over and talk about that for a minute. So who was I, I? You know, in pre-production we were talking, and the name Wolfman Jack came to uh, to the surface. And uh, let's let's talk. So for the people who may not know, who's Wolfman Jack? Okay, he was, how about American Graffiti? You have to have seen that movie. That's okay. That's true. I didn't even think about that because I always think of him on television doing the Midnight Special. You yeah, know, you know. But but all right. By the way, he was he was born in Brooklyn. I did not know. I didn't know that, um, yeah. and I also did not know that originally he did radio from Mexico. Yeah, and, he's outlawed. Right, and and the thing is, they used like a two hundred fifty thousand watt station, so it was essentially what was sort of like satellite is today. Because I was reading that you could hear him going cross country on your radio because the signal was so strong. I guess they had a uh, an antenna very close to the border. And it had a huge, powerful signal, and it penetrated a lot of uh, North America. And 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 at some point, I think he moved his production uh, to part of the United States, and then they would ship the tapes to Mexico just to play it because he had such he had such a gigantic reach. So, how did you get to meet him? Well, I besides going to concerts all the time, I helped promote car shows in South Florida. And he was at one of my car shows, and I said, hey, look, man, you want to go out to my uh, house in Jupiter Farms and howl with my wolves? And he said, sure, lady. So we hopped <laughs> in my Corvette, and we went up to my house, and I pulled up in the driveway, and he goes, oh, my God, you have wolves. <laughs> so, you know, so and it wasn't cell phone time, so there was no video I could take of He got out, and he goes, well, what do I do? I said, you just start howling. He got out of the car and he walked over and he started howling and my wolf started howling. And the neighbor guy walked over and he goes, is that who I think it is? And I said, yeah, well, the one and only wolf man. And he howled at my wolf for about 15, 20 minutes or so. Wow. And I took him back to the car show and his agent goes, well, how is her wolves? He goes, oh my God, this lady really had wolves. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, for the was, people, no. so for the people who don't know you as well as I do, how, how did you have wolves? What was the story about that? Because most people don't in keep the, wolves. <laughs> in the state of Florida, you can have exotic animals, and I just wanted wolves, so I had a couple pairs of wolves. My and, neighbors had lions, other neighbors had tigers, you know, and it was South Florida. I, I, I bet you there was a lot of meat <laughs> consumed in that neighborhood. Sold, yes. <laughs> Wait, so wait, where did you go get go to the the store and get like you know a puppy that, that wolf chow or something? Or <laughs> no, they actually ate dog food. I did give them some meat sometime and some bones, but they ate dog food. Oh, okay, and what were they like? What were they like as 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 were they were like with like pets or was it more like a sanctuary? No, they were pets. I mean, they came in the house and they protect. They were, were I I had two daughters at the time and we were a pack and they would be very protective over me and my children. So and, and, let's put it that way. I never got my house robbed. <laughs> so when it, when when it was show and tell at school, um, did they bring uh, did they bring their pets I, in? <laughs> yes, my youngest daughter. I believe we had to take one of the wolves in for show and tell. Um, and of course, all the pajama parties. Everybody had to see the wolves out back when we had pajama parties. And did did, did was there howling contests? <laughs> yeah. You know, they really howl when the full moon comes. I mean, they howled a lot, but when the full moon came out, they did howl more. Uh, so, so there's there's the Wolf Man, and then uh, I believe you you know some people from Steppenwolf. Yeah, John K. Okay, um, I did car shows with him, and uh, the car, and then he just happened to we were go, his his roadie and stuff. Or what I said, well, come on down to the Keys and everything, and then we actually went down to the Keys because. I worked for a probation office, and they were sorry that we never got to do much of anything, so they took us to the Keys for the weekend. Wow. And so who, who else have you met that that, uh, that was part of the world of entertainment, rock and roll? Uh, 
there's, <laughs> there's so many different ones. Like this summer, for instance, I went to 20 different concerts in 30 days. Right. So it's like you were kind of like a deadhead, but not, but not like just to one band. You just really just no. moved around. Music, yes. Yeah. So if there's a concert within a hundred miles, I'm usually there. Wow. So who, who? So like, okay, this year or the last couple of years, who have who have you seen and, and hung out with? Now, okay. Well, I'm a little bit older now. Back when I was in my twenties or thirties, I could you know get backstage passes. But now that you're older, that wears off, kind of. But I can give you the list of the bands I did see this summer in okay. concert. All right, who'd you see? Okay, Zappa Band, okay. Foreigner, Train, Ariel Speedwagon, Joan Jett, Cheap Trick, King Crimson, Grand Funk, The Starship, The Almond Bats Band, Hermit's Hermits, Sheena Easton, Blue Oyster Cult, Beetle Cues, Wild Feathers, Great White, Vixen, Three Dog Night. Flog and Molly, Grassroots, Blackberry Smoke, and Virgil Kane. Wow. Now, have you seen any of these bands that were around a long time ago? Um, and what was like the difference between their performances, like Foreigner, for example? Did you see Foreigner in the 80s, maybe? The Blue Oyster Cult, I happened to see in the 80s and 90s, only because uh, it was the, Blue Oy- the Cult Brothers. Okay. That they had split up back then, and my dear friend is no longer with us. Uh, Billy Hilfiger played with the Colt Brothers, so I actually got to, you know, when they were playing down in South Florida, I got to see them and go backstage and everything. So when you're backstage, what's it like? Um, oh, it's awesome. Well, <laughs> describe like like so. I I've interviewed a lot of uh, the rock musicians in the green room at my father's place when they were at the Roslyn Hotel. And uh, like I met Carmen Apici, so he was at the uh-huh. hotel, and we hung out in the lobby, and it was quiet because it was like sound check time, and they were doing the sound check, and I guess they were taking a break, and they you know they didn't have a lot of time to go somewhere between the sound check and the start of the show, and it was too early to eat, so we're sitting down, and I said, hey, could we do a little radio? He's like, you know, of course, he's cool. And he's like, sure. And, you know, so we're talking. And, uh, you know, we, we just talked like two people who kind of knew each other for a long time. And I guess now that they've had a lot of experience under their, their wings, they want to talk about it. Because currently, if you notice, and, and this is one of the things that concerns me, is that the radio p- enterprise doesn't really interview the artists anymore like they used to. There was a time when the, the, some band would be in town, uh, you know, Mick Fleet with the, you know, the Mick Fleet, Fleetwood Mac at the Garden or, I don't know, uh, Rainbow or somebody would be, at, you know, Richie Blackmore. Which was, and, and they would show up at the radio station. Maybe the concert was at seven or eight. They'd be at the station at three. they take a couple of calls, they would say hello, they would talk about the new album they were promoting. Uh, maybe the station would give a couple of tickets away. And it was a whole cool venture. And you felt like you got to meet and and, and see a little bit of the inside of the band. Um, and then sometimes, you know, you, someone like a Jimmy Page would show up and you'd be blown away, you know, that you get to hear... Uh, about songs and, and 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 what was the inspiration behind a song, or what they were uh, touring, what was like the tour like? Because you never really got a lot of that, you know, in other places. There was no social media. There was no information. I mean, maybe you got it through a magazine or uh, trade papers or things like that, but nothing, you know, that a, a regular nothing personal. Yeah. Like- you know, back in the days, they used to, the local radio station would interview, going back to Frankie Valley. you know, they would have them in the station talking on the radio, yeah. you know, giving free tickets out to the concert. You know, they don't have any anymore. I, I'll, I'll tell you a great little story. So when I went to school, uh, one of the people I sat near in one of my classes was Karen Vecchio. So Karen, if you're listening, give me a call. And she loved Frankie Valley. That's the way I, she loved, she would write, she had like, you know, all of his album, all the music. I think she had, the Loose Leaf had pictures, you know, Frankie Valley, Frankie Valley, Frankie Valley. And I, I still remember she was a, a huge fan. So 
And, uh, you know, it, it shows you how important music is and was to young people because we all identified with music. There was a, uh, I remember there were people who were into Jethro Tull. I remember there were people into all these different bands. Uh, uh, I do have a good story about Jethro Tull, though. Oh, let's Ian hear it. Anderson. Well, yeah, Ian Anderson, oh. yes, who's, who's yeah. still touring. At, yeah. Yeah. I was in Ithaca at a concert, and this guy come up to me with a long trench coat on, and he was passing my maybe party favors around, and I used the party favor, and my friend Richie goes, D -d 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 look who that is. And I go, huh? You know? And next thing I know, he takes the flute out and walks up on stage. And I actually <laughs> party with Ian Anderson at Cornell back in the 70s. Wow. So, so if you're listening, I remember it. <laughs> well, was that, was that the Aqualung tour or was that the War Child tour? You know, I can't remember because, as I said, I was having party favors. Ah, okay. <laughs> now, I can tell you that one of the first albums I remember buying was War Child. It was probably the Aqualung. Okay. Probably. I remember buying War Child, and I was amazed at the album artwork, especially on the reverse side, because the reverse side of the album had a picture that represented a lot of the songs. Like there was a song called Queen and Country, so there was, a, you know, there was a song called Skating Away, and you'd see somebody like skating. Um, and then there was War Child, and, and I just remember it was all these you know, very cool artistic representations that, you know, you don't really see because now everything is either streamed or podcast and the artwork is either, you know, very small or you're looking at it, your phone and a lot of that, you know, remember Thick as a Brick? It was a newspaper. Yes. Yeah. You know, did, did you actually have that album? Yeah. I, remember, I have over 10,000 record albums. I have every album that I can, you can imagine. Wow. Like so, I had the big bamboo album and just two years ago, three years ago, I went up to, Buffalo and Cheech and Chong signed my album, plus signed the paper. And ah. Tommy Chong goes, "I can't believe you didn't use our paper." And I said, "Well, I used one, but this is like I have several albums." <laughs> so, but yeah, I have like ten thousand record albums. I have all the Jeff Rotel albums. So, so where did you buy all of these albums? Did you buy them? In flea markets, did you buy them in record stores? Did you get uh, production copies, or did you get? No, it was really pretty cool. I, I, both my brothers were in the navy, and they would come home on leave, and they'd forget to buy their little sister something. So they'd run into the PX when they came home, and they'd buy records for a quarter apiece. So every time they walked home from coming from leave, there would be ten, fifteen albums they'd buy me, and that went on for a long time, and then. Uh, they they passed. I got their record album collection, and then it just went from there. Everybody, when they started getting rid of their albums, oh, that I'll take them. That I'll take them. And wow. then I, even to this very day, I still like a couple years ago, I was with a dear friend and uh, found found up buying two hundred albums for ten dollars. <laughs> I haven't even sorted them yet, but yeah, it, it just it just snowballs when you have that many albums. How do you keep them from warping? I have them all standing up, <laughs> and, and all of them are standing up, so that won't happen. Okay, so they're standing up, and then are they kind of pressed together, so to speak, so, so they're all tight? They're all tight okay. <laughs> when you have that many. I, you know. What do you play them on? <laughs> it's funny as you mentioned it. I have about eight turntables. I'm finding that some of my turntables aren't doing very good right now, but I'm going to take care of that. But I have like eight turntables, and when I – go to flea markets or garage sales and I find more turntables or I buy them. What was, what is your turntable of choice? Would it happen to be the Technics? You know, if I had a choice, it would be a Gerard. Okay. But, and yeah. Where do you get the liquid for the disc washer? <laughs> <laughs> now, do, I assume you, for people who don't know, the disc washer was this like red velvet brick. And one, you know, the, the bottom part, the base part would be like, I guess, waters. It was solid. And then the red velvet part, you would put some kind of liquid on, and then you would wipe the disc, and it would take the dust out of it. Um, and yeah, I just, have a lint, I just have a lint cleaner. I use, always <laughs> use my lint cleaner. So, All right. Now, do you miss the hisses, pops, and crackles that vinyl brought? You well, know, I can listen to it every day. 
And right. it's not, you know, I don't, that, that's the sound. I don't want to listen to other sounds. I want the LP sound. You know, when an arm slide goes over and it goes down, there's nothing that beats that sound. And, you know, even the scratches are okay. Many musicians have often said in interviews that the vinyl sound has just never been replicated in any of the, no. new, the new recording technologies. And never will be. All right, we're moving along here. So um, we're going to call back. We're going to call back. We're going to come back in a minute. We've got to take a quick break. Uh, we've got to take care of some uh, things right here. But don't, don't leave. We'll be right back. Richard Solomon, welcome you back. Taking your business by Father's Place Radio. Sometimes we call this show out of the box. There's a lot of platforms. We're all over the place. We're on YouTube. We're on every kind of podcast platform. We are streamcast on FM radio. So wherever we catch you, thank you for listening. All right. So we have Donna here. And Donna is from the great state of New York. And uh, she has been to gazillions of concerts. We, uh, you know, uh, on our station, we have lots of, uh, you know, the rock show. We have all kinds of uh, great uh, music programming. So someone like Don is a wealth of information. So we were talking a little bit during the break. And uh, so you, you wanted to go to Woodstock, but you couldn't. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, my mother said I was too young because I was 14, but all my friends from the local town were all going there because they were 16 and 17. So when they showed up to the house, my mother said, no, she's way too young. (laughs) So, of course, I ran upstairs and pouted. So come Saturday morning, she goes, oh, get into the car. I'll take you to that stupid concert. And we couldn't even get near the place. We got about two hours away and it was nothing but a parking lot. So... I did miss that Woodstock, but I did go to Woodstock 25 anniversary. What was that like? You know, it was good when they had the old bands playing, but when they introduced the newer bands and they were kind of like violent and uh, I wound up getting crowd crushed and wound up in the hospital for three days. Ooh. So, yeah. Yeah. I got, got my neck broken Ooh. <laughs> again. Yeah. So, Ooh. but the, the music was really good. Aerosmith was good. You know, Melissa Etheridge was great. It was just when they introduced the new music with the old music. It didn't go well. Gotcha. Well, you know, Woodstock was, I guess, and, and Summer Jam were kind of well known for having at least relatively peaceful crowds, given the yes. enormous size of what was there. So, you know. Completely. I, yeah. So... So let's talk a little bit about some of the close encounters of the you know, music legend kind. So you, you got to hang out with the people from Def Leppard? Yeah, I got backstage with Def Leppard in the 90s down in, I believe it was Miami at that time, at the Miami Beach. And they were pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so did you hang out with Joe Elliott? Did you get, you know, did you talk, get to talk to him about what they were? First of all, was this before the show or after the show? This was after the show. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah. And what you know? Do you remember which tour this was? Or uh, Hysteria, maybe. Okay, that was a great uh, album. Al- yeah, I believe that was the album they were doing that. You get, did you get any? Nineteen ninety-two. Did you get any autographs, or <laughs> pictures? Or? Yes, I got autographs. I have autographs from a lot of these people. <laughs> wow. You have a whole. Do you, so, how do you keep all the all the autographs like? Do you have like albums and like, you know, photo albums? How do you keep them all organized? Photo albums. Okay. You know, I try to, you know. And, and, you know, when you go to concerts, you don't really get like a, you know, like a program or a guide, you know, and you don't necessarily yeah. want to walk around with like vinyl records. <laughs> so what did you get like them to sign? Like napkins and ticket stubs and things like that? You know, the ticket stubs usually. Oh, but that's... actually Hermit's Hermits, when I saw them, he actually signed my album. So oh, that's cool. He's really good. He's really good about that. Right. So, and then you would tell me that there was a you had an encounter with Edgar Winter. Yeah, I was doing a concert slash car show down in Florida, and I was talking to Edgar Winter about riding around in a golf cart to pick out his favorite car. And John Kay walked over, and he goes, "What are you talking to that bunny rabbit for?" 
you know, at first I thought they were serious and they were just kidding around. And um, because you know, I would have to take the band people around to pick out their favorite custom car. So I got to actually meet them by driving around on a golf cart. Yeah. Um, were you insured? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and my, my favorite memory is with Dion. Uh, he was I, he was stuck with me, and he, he goes, "What's your name?" And I said, "Donna." He goes, "Are you a prima donna?" And I said, "I don't know, but you're stuck with me." So, and at the end of the day, he goes, "Yeah, you're pretty much a prima donna." <laughs> <laughs> well, D- D- okay. So Dion's cousins are a band called the Bronx Wanderers, and they're great people. And I've interviewed them, and I've seen them and perform, and they're really, really cool. Um, and he, I think Dion, not that long ago, I think he did like a bio, an autobiography, um, if I'm not mistaken. So, but uh, do you ever read any of the autobiographies of any of the artists? Do, 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 I've read. Sh- oh, I haven't seen her in concert, but I have read Cher's autobiography on okay. her. Yeah. yeah. Do you find that these these autobiographies bring anything to light for you Cher's as a, as a fan? Okay. Yeah, Cher's I really did because how she started out, she was scared to sing unless Sonny was standing by her. Uh, Jimmy Buffett's was a little bit difficult, his autobiography. How so? He said, it was hard to follow, and it wasn't really about the music, but Cher's was all about how she really started out in the, in the music. Do you, do you as, a, as a reader, did you feel like Jimmy Buffett's book um, wasn't edited well enough to, or, you know, it was written more like by someone who's just assumed you knew more than you did. I don't answer, can't answer that question, but I just said it was like nothing what I thought he was going to talk about. I no. thought he was going to talk about South Florida. And I thought he was going to talk about, you know, get it. And he, and he didn't at all. Yeah. Did he mention Rick Springfield in his book? Pardon me. <laughs> I, no. I needed I needed a segue. So, so you so you you're telling me a little story about Rick Springfield. Well, I was at this state fair a couple years ago, and Rick Springfield said that he was going to be doing some of his new music, and he goes, "I don't want any of you to get up to go to the bathroom when I'm doing my new stuff. You're going to stay and listen to it." So, I want T-shirts, and if you buy T-shirts before and after, the lines are long. So I decided I'm just going to just slowly move over to the T-shirt sales and get me a T-shirt. And he starts on stage and, hey, you, hey, <laughs> you, yeah, you, Blondie. You know, and then I realized, I turned around, I pointed, me? And he goes, yeah, you. I told you to stay seated. And I said, well, I'm buying your T-shirt. And he goes, yeah. He goes, when did this whole thing come about buying these overpriced T-shirts and everything? And it was kind of funny. He goes, okay, continue on go buy my t-shirt and then go sit down and listen to my music. Well, you know, so you know, it'd be really cool. There are databases out there of concerts and I'd love to pull the concert and actually find the tape that yeah. had that and then, and then play that in the background of all of this. Cause that I would, would love to have a copy of that. <laughs> you know, there, there are, there are databases out there that have, you know, a hundred thousand live shows and, um, yeah, and he yelled at me for going to buy a T-shirt. <laughs> so, so what year was this? That was uh, 2019. It was pre, yeah, it was the last concert, and he was at the state fair. All right, I'm going to look that up. I'm going to look up uh, Rick Springfield, and if I if if I could actually find it and pull that segment, I'll actually edit it into the tape. <laughs> that would be awesome. I would and it, love to hear that. So, if, if I could get Rick Springfield to go, hey, Blondie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you buying his t-shirt you know and then so and then if i do that i'll call you and you'll have to give me a like a, a jpeg of the shirt so i could put the shirt and the audio all together and we could kind of segue that into this uh when we put yeah, it up on if, youtube if he does hear this he needs to sign my t-shirt all right he so rick yells at me rick, he doesn't sign my t-shirt rick we we're reaching out to you. So we've reached out to a couple people. So we reached out to somebody I went to school with. Now we're reaching out to Rick Springfield. Now we have a, a big enough reach. We have, you know, a, a big following uh, between FM podcasting, Streamcast, um, Amazon Prime. We're we're kind of almost everywhere. So for people out there, if you know someone who knows someone, because that's how these things get done, uh, maybe we'll get a you know uh, you can send us 
um, an email uh, through the station. And uh, or you can send us uh, if you go to the Solomon Channel dot com. There's all kinds of ways to find us. And uh, maybe we can get somebody like uh, Rick Springfield's people to uh, see we, about getting the, uh, the, the autograph. T-shirt that you, sign. You know, that, that you're so, so worthy of, of getting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then the other thing we can do is uh, next time uh, Rick is out there in concert land, uh, maybe we can have a big poster that says, this, it, Blondie's back. <laughs> <laughs> I, and if he's in town, I will be at his concert. That's for sure. I never miss him. There you go. So um, in the little time that we have left, um, you, you, let's talk about Herman's Hermits. You, yes. you see them at the State Fair. So which State Fair is this? Is this the one in Syracuse? New York State Fair in Syracuse, yes. That was and about 100 and something years in, in running. It's a, it's a well, well-known State Fair. Yes, and it has two bands every day for 10 days. Oh, wow. So who who have you seen in the State Fair over the years? Uh, Hermit's Hermit, well, the, the list I gave you, uh, uh, the Beach Boys were up there a few years ago. Oh, okay. Uh, I've seen uh, we had Al the Jardine Doobie at Brothers my, up there. We had Al Jardine at my father's place. Okay. okay. Um, Doobie the, Brothers, okay. Was that Doobie with, Brothers. With, with or without uh, Michael McDonald? Without. Okay. Yeah. I've also seen, uh, I've seen Foreigner and I've seen Foghat. Okay. And, and of course, you know, the lo- locally our Jeff Hall that was playing with Foghat. He just lives in Newfield now. He traveled with Foghat, for, um, The Outlaws and Sabre Brown. Okay. And now he's in just a local band around here. But, you know, seeing them at the fair. Um, I remember seeing The Outlaws and Molly Hatchet. In the Broom County Arena a long time ago. And they were good. They were good. Yes. Yeah. So, seen Molly Hatchet. You know, I've, there's just so many concerts. It's just, they all blend in together. But the um, State Fair. Um, you, you ever see Leonard Skinner? I was had, went to go see him this year, but the concert got canceled oh, because of the COVID. The CMAC because of the COVID. I was kind of like, oh, I had tickets for that. And it got canceled in the CMAC last, last, last year. Um, I remember watching something about Leonard Skinner. It was like a documentary. And apparently they opened for the Rolling Stones. And one of the things that the Rolling Stones has on stage is like the big tongue that goes out to the audience. And yeah, I've seen the Rolling Stones, so I know what you mean. Right. So I guess Rolling Stones management told them, don't go on the tongue. <laughs> Do, do what you want, but don't go on the tongue. And sure enough, you see all of them jamming together, walking, you know, to the tip of the tongue. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So I saw the Rolling Stones at Giant Stadium uh, in 2019, and I thought that was a spectacular show. Uh, I've seen them steal wheels at Shea Stadium. Uh, they, they always give just a phenomenal show. And yeah. it's amazing how much energy... Uh, Mick Jagger has, you know, just jumping all over the and place. The, I just saw him a couple of years ago, and he still has the same energy. That was in yeah. Philadelphia. So, 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 you've seen the Stones over the years. Aren't they pretty much like kind of the same? I mean, they just play great music, and they've got a lot of energy, and they've got a nice repertoire of music, and uh, they play a lot of the same stuff um, from year to year because those are the classics. You know, it's like there's always sympathy for the devil. Um, and uh, I say sometimes they play, play Street Fighting Man. Uh, sometimes they play Start Me Up. Uh, but but they, they're always, I mean, they're always consistently good. Yes, you know? they are. And, and as I said, uh, Mick Jagger, I think it was like six months after he had that heart attack, and he was still bouncing around the stage like nothing happened. Now, how could a guy like him, who's so thin, <laughs> have a heart attack? He looks like he's in great shape. He's toned. He, he he gets aerobic exercise all over the place, and he looks like he takes care of himself. He does. I had met, I had a couple of girls work with me one time, and they travel with the Stones, and they said that he was constantly jogging in the morning, eating nothing but healthy food every day. Well, you, you know, the, you know, the internet has some really funny things. So, um, not that long ago, I saw a picture of a young Keith Richards holding an infant in his arms, and the caption was. 
a rare photo of Keith Richards holding an infant Betty White. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so. but but they they were always you know I think the Rolling Stones are coming up on their 60th anniversary. Yeah, so, so that's kind of cool. So to close everything up, what do you think about Summer Jam 50? Are you going to be behind it? Are you going to promote it? Oh, you know, I want everybody out there listening. Get some promoter behind it. I live in near Watkins Glen. I'll help you out. We need to convince the town, and it would help New York State out. It would help in the music scene. We need people to get together again and have a concert like that and understand the summer jam, what it was all about. Well, and if that place is big enough, you, you know, the last time they canceled the Woodstock too, they, cause it, it said it wasn't, but they have that many people at NASCAR year after year. So if they can have that many people at NASCAR, why can't we have them at a concert? Well, we could have certainly the second generation of people. I know that Amy Helm played at my father's place. She's the daughter of uh, LaVon Helm. And I, you, mm-hmm. you talked about the Almond Betts brand, band. Yeah, uh, and they could be playing. They, they could be playing, and then you know the 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 dead are still around. Um, yeah, you know they're still playing and uh, still uh, doing all kinds of great stuff uh, all these years later. Um, so it's kind of possible that you know you could have a reconfiguration somewhat. Of uh, the Summer Jam, uh, maybe the 50th get some... anniversary of Summer Jam. It should happen, and it should be recorded, and, and the band should be interviewed. <laughs> so, yes, so <laughs> really. So, do you do anything to help promote concerts to your local area, or bring in any, or do anything with radio or anything like that? And if you aren't, I why aren't I, you? When I live, when I did, I did in South Florida, but now I'm kind of like semi-retired. But in South Florida, as I said, I had car shows, which brought in all the local bands. And I worked with um, was it Phantasma back then in the days. And then I did the TV stations and the radio stations when I lived in South Florida. But up here, it's a pretty small area. Right. But it's large enough for Summer Jam, though. So Watkins Glen, they have racing up there still? Yes. And they have what's, when's racing NASCAR? season? Uh, from May till... October, uh, September, okay. the last of the, the last of the year is a vintage car race. But they have NASCAR every year in July or August. And how many people attend? Over five hundred thousand. Wow! So, so five hundred thousand is just a little, just a little notch under the six hundred thousand mark. And now, right. and, and if you're prepared for five hundred thousand people, that means they've got all kinds of facility support. And, and infrastructure to Camping, support. Camping, yeah. hotels, camps, you know, state parks. There's so many campgrounds around this area and a lot of hotels. And we had the big wine tour countries up there. And there's so many hotels that sponsors them. Wow. So it's hard to believe that we're basically out of time. So Oh, so, okay. So I want to kind of put, play my, my outgoing music. But I want to thank you so much for sharing some great details of music history because uh, – the interviews like this are going to live on long after, uh, you know, all the musicians and the music are in the popular mindset. So thank you for adding historical context uh, to everything out there. So thank you for having us and thank you for all, everyone out there. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Whoa!